the lady of the basement flat by mrs george de horn vesey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by judy mason chapter one why not at three o'clock this afternoon evelyn wastneys died i am evelyn wastneys and i died standing at the door of an old country home in ireland with my hands full of ridiculous little silver shoes and horseshoes and a paris hat on my head and a trembling treble voice whispering in my ear good-bye evelyn darling darling thank you thank you for all you've been to me oh evelyn promise you will not be unhappy then some mysterious hidden muscle whose existence i had never before suspected pulled two little strings at the corners of my mouth and my lips smiled a marionette smile and a marionette voice cried jauntily unhappy never why i am free i am going to begin to live then i watched a tall bridegroom in tweeds tenderly help a little bride in mole-coloured taffeta and sable furs into the waiting car the horn blew the engines whirled a big hand and a little one flourished handkerchiefs out of the window a white satin shoe danced ridiculously after the wheels and aunt emmeline cried sensibly that's over thank goodness the wind is sharp let's have tea she hurried into the house to give orders and the old evelyn wastneys stood staring after the car as it sped down the drive passed through the lodge gates and spun out into the high road she had the strangest most curious feeling that it was only the ghost of herself who stood there a ghost in a paris hat and gown with long suede gloves wrinkled up her arms and a pendant of mingled initials sparkling on her lace waistcoat the real true evelyn a little naked shivering creature was scurrying after that car bleeding piteously to be taken in but the car rolled on quicker and quicker its occupants too much taken up with themselves to have time to waste on dull other people in another minute it was out of sight but the ghost did not come back the new evelyn lingered upon the steps waiting for it to return there was such a blank empty ache in the place where her heart used to be it seemed impossible that that scurrying little ghost would not come back nestle again in its own place and warm up the empty void but it never came back the new evelyn turned and walked into the house well it has all gone off very well kathleen looked quite nice though i always do say that a real lace veil is less becoming than tulle there was a rose and thistle pattern right across her nose and personally i think those sheaves of lilies are too large i hope she'll be happy i'm sure mr anderson seems a nice man but one never knows it's always a risk going abroad a young canadian proposed to me as a girl i said to him do you think you could be nice enough to make up to me for home and country and relations and friends and associations and customs and everything i have valued all my life he said it was a matter of opinion what did i think i said it was ridiculous nonsense no man was nice enough so he married rosa bates and i hear their second boy is a hunchback you're eating nothing my dear take a scone let's hope it's all for the best best or worst it's done now i said gloomily basil anderson was certainly nice and unlike aunt emmeline my sister kathleen entertained no doubt that he could fill every gap 
home country friends a selection of elderly aunts and even that only sister who had so far acted as buffer between herself and the storms of life at this very moment the mole-coloured toque was probably reclining comfortably on the tweed shoulder and a smile was replacing tears as a big booming voice cried comfortably evelyn oh she'll be all right don't worry about evelyn honey think of me following the line of least resistance i took the scone and chewed it vacantly figuratively speaking it tasted of dust and ashes literally it tasted of nothing at all and the tea was just a hot fluid which had to be swallowed at intervals as medicine is swallowed of necessity aunt emmeline helped herself systematically from each of the plates in turn working steadily through courses of bread and butter sandwiches scone petit four and wedding cake she was a scraggy woman with the appetite of a giant kathy and i used to wonder where the food went probably to her tongue of course said aunt emmeline continuing her thoughts aloud as was her disconcerting habit kathleen has money and that gives a wife a whip hand i begged her only yesterday to stand up for herself those little fair women are so apt to be bullied i knew a case well mind we hope it mayn't come to that if she is sensible and doesn't expect too much things may work out all right especially for the first years if anything does go wrong it'll be your fault evelyn for spoiling her as you've done thanks very much for the cheering thought i said snappily aunt emmeline helped herself to a sandwich and blinked with exasperating forbearance not cheerful perhaps but it may be useful if you'd taken my advice it's never too late to mend evelyn even at twenty-six aunt emmeline surveyed me critically she was taking stock and considering just how young how old how fresh how damaged those lengthy years had left my physical charms i looked in a long glass opposite and took stock at the same time a smart young woman oh very smart indeed for as kathy had argued if you can't blow expense for your only sister's wedding when on earth are you going to do it light brown hair still untouched by grey hazel eyes with very long very finely marked eyebrows secretly they are the joy of my life good features and a sulky expression the old evelyn used to be very good-looking she's dead now so i can say so as much as i like this new one is good-looking too in a disagreeable unattractive kind of way if you saw her dining at the next table in an hotel you would say rather a fine-looking girl and the man with you would reply think so too much of a temper for my fancy glad she doesn't belong to me i realized as much as i looked in the glass and that made me crosser than ever if i had been alone able to cry or storm or grizzle or go to bed just as i liked i could have borne it better but fancy losing your home and your occupation and the only person in all the world you really loved all in one day and coming straight from the wreck to have tea with aunt emmeline the sandwich was finished before the inspection a piece of scone followed of course said aunt emmeline you are not in your first bloom that we can't expect your colour is a little harder and more fixed the figure in the glass gave a spasmodic jerk the sulky expression was pierced by a gleam of fear fixed good gracious she might be talking of those old people who have little red lines over their cheekbones in the place of bloom it's ridiculous to say i'm fixed it's a matter of indifference to me how i look but i do insist on truth and your air of pride and independence is unbecoming in an unmarried girl men like to see a girl sweet clinging pliant what men all men oh and in my case for instance 
to whom would you suggest i should proceed to cling that said aunt emmeline briskly is precisely what i wish to discuss she lifted the last morsel of scone from the plate stared at it and popped it into her mouth my dear has it ever occurred to you to think what you are going to do aunt emmeline for the last months it has rarely occurred to me to think of anything else very well then that's all to the good as i said to aunt eliza let us leave her alone till kathleen has gone evelyn is obstinate and if you interfere she will only grow more pig-headed let her find things out for herself experience eliza will do more than either you or i sooner or later even evelyn must realize that you can't run a house and garden and stable in the same way on half the ordinary income now that kathleen is married she naturally takes with her her own fortune she looked at me expectantly and i smiled another stiff marionette smile and said how true curiously enough that fact has already penetrated to my dull brain now i do hope and pray evelyn that you are not going to argue with me cried aunt emmeline with a sudden access of energy which was positively startling it's ridiculous saying that because there's only one mistress instead of two expense will therefore be halved i've kept house for thirty-three years and have never once allowed an order at the door so i may be supposed to know nonsense the rent is the same i suppose and the rates and the taxes you must sit down to a decent meal even if you are alone and it takes the same fire to cook four potatoes as eight your garden must be kept going and if you do away with one horse you still require a groom i suppose to look after the rest don't talk to me of economizing you'd be up to your neck in debt before a year was over if you weren't in a lunatic asylum with nervous depression living alone in that hole-in-a-corner old house with not a soul but servants to speak to from morning till night you have a nervous temperament evelyn you may not realize it but i remember as a child how you used to fidget and dash about dear cathy sat still and sucked her thumb i said at the time evelyn is better looking but mark my words cathy will be married first and you see it's because i love you my dear and you are my dear sister's child that i warn you to beware of living alone in that house thank you so much i say nastily when people presage and remark by saying that they only say it because they love you you may lay long odds that it's going to be disagreeable it certainly sounds a gruesome prospect not even a choice between bankruptcy and mania but a certainty of both and within a year too such a short run for one's money aunt eliza had some suggestion to make then and you evidently approved would you mind telling me exactly what it was that is what i am trying to do but you will interrupt naturally your home is with us your mother's sisters you shall have the blue room over the porch if you wish it we are willing that you should bring your own pictures the silver and valuables you can send to the bank and the furniture can be sold you shall pay us five guineas a week and we will keep your horse and house old bridget if you don't want to part from her she can attend to your room and sleep in the third attic there would be no extras except washing and a fire in your room you know how we live every comfort but no excess i disapprove of excess eliza and i have often regretted that you and kathy have such extravagant ways early tea as if you were old women and bare shoulders for dinner you may laugh my dear but it's no laughing matter one thing leads to another you can't wear an evening dress and sit down to a chop soup and fish and an entree before you know where you are we have high tea you would save money on evening gowns alone a dressy blouse is all that is required aunt emmeline paused to draw breath twitched jerked and resolutely braced herself to say a difficult thing and and we shall welcome you my dear 
we shall be pleased to have you through all her protestations of welcome through all her effort at warmth the plain unflattering truth forced its way out to entertain a young independent niece beneath their roof might seem to the two aunts a duty but most certainly most obviously would not be a pleasure i was quite convinced that for myself it would be a fiery trial to accept the offer but it was a shock to realize that the aunts felt the same i reviewed the situation from the two points of view while aunt emmeline feverishly hacked at the hard sugar coating of the cake for a young comparatively young woman to go from the liberty of her own home to share the stuffy conventional dull proper do nothing but fuss and talk for ever about nothing life of two old ladies in a country town would obviously be a change for the worse but for the aforesaid old ladies to have their trivial life enriched by the advent of a young attractive and when she is in a good temper lively and amusing niece this should surely be a joy and a gain but it wasn't a joy the poor old dears were shuddering at the thought that their peaceful routine might be spoiled they didn't want a bright young influence they wanted to be free to do as they liked sup luxuriously on cocoa and an egg turn up black cashmere skirts over wadded petticoats and doze before the fire discuss the servant's failings by the hour drink glasses of hot water and go to bed at ten o'clock as she hacked up the sugar crust the corners of aunt emmeline's lips turned more and more downward my silence had been taken for consent and in the recesses of her heart she was saying to herself farewell a long farewell to all our frowstings i felt sorry for the poor old soul and hastened to put her out of her misery it's very good of you aunt emmeline and aunt eliza thank you very much but i have quite decided to have a home of my own even though i can't afford to keep on the clow i am going to live in london just for one second uncontrollable relief and joy gleamed from the watching eyes then the mask fell and she valiantly tried to look distressed oh evelyn obstinate again sitting yourself up to know better than your elders there'll be a bitter awakening for you some day my dear and when it comes you'll be glad enough of your old auntie's help well the door will never be closed against you however hard and ungrateful you may be we shall remember our duty to our sister's child whenever you choose to return i shall see the candle burning in the casement window she looked so pained so shocked that if i had had any heart left i should have put my arms round her neck and begged her pardon with a kiss but i had no heart only something cold and hard and tight which made it impossible to be loving or kind so i said hastily i shall certainly want to pay you a visit some day it is very kind of you to promise to have me after living in london fur bay will seem quite a haven of rest aunt emmeline accepted the olive branch with a sniff but why london she inquired why not i replied it was the only answer it seemed possible to make end of chapter one chapter two of the lady of the basement flat by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain aunt eliza speaks it is two days after the wedding kathy has been mrs basil anderson for forty-eight hours and no doubt looks back upon her spinster existence as a vague unsatisfactory dream she is reclining on a deck chair on board the great ship which is bearing her to her new home and her devoted husband is hovering by her side i can just imagine how she looks in her white blanket coat and the blue hood just the right shade to go with her eyes 
an artful little curl which has taken her quite three minutes to arrange falling over one temple and her spandy little shoes stretched out at full length i know those shoes by special request i rubbed the soles on the gravel paths so that they might not look too newly married quite certainly kathy will be throwing an occasional thought to the girl she left behind her a poor old evelyn with a dim pitiful little ache at the thought of my barren lot quite certainly too for one moment when she remembers there will be twenty when she forgets quite right of course quite natural and wifelike and just as it should be and only a selfish ungenerous wretch could wish it to be otherwise all the same i wrenched myself out of the aunt's clutches yesterday morning on the plea of going home to tidy up though the wedding took place from their house all the preparatory muddle happened here and it will take days and days to go through kathy's rooms alone and decide what to keep what to give away and what to burn outright the drawers were littered with pretty rubbish oddments of ribbon old gloves crumpled flowers and the like it goes against the principles of any right-minded female to give away tawdry fineries and yet and yet could i bear to destroy them to see those little white gloves shrivel up in the flames the high-heeled little slippers crumble and split it would seem like making a bonfire of kathy herself i tidied and arranged and packed into fresh parcels working at fever heat with my hands while all the time the voice in my brain kept repeating now evelyn what are you going to do what are you going to do my dear with your blank new life to leave the old home and start afresh that is as far as i have got so far but i must make up my mind and quickly too for this house is too full of memories to be a healthy shelter kathy and i have lived here ever since we left school first with father then after his death with an old governess companion since her marriage a year ago we've been alone luxuriating in our freedom and soothing the protestations of aunts by constant promises to look out for a successor then kathy met basil anderson and no one was cruel enough to grudge us our last months together now i'm alone with no one in the world to consider beside myself with my own home to make my own work to find my own happiness to discover does it make it better or worse i wonder that i am rich and the question of money does not enter in ninety-nine people out of a hundred would answer at once that it is better but i'm not so sure if i had a tiny income just enough to insure me from absolute want hard regular work would be necessary and might be good for body and brain i want work i must have it if i am to keep going but the mischief is i have never been taught to be useful and i have no idea what i could do i can drive a car i can ride anything that goes on four legs i can dance and skate and arrange flowers with taste i can re-trim a hat and at a pinch make a whole blouse i can order a nice meal and grumble when it is spoiled i can strum on the piano and paint christmas cards i can entertain a house-party of bigwigs i have also it seems a queer thing to say a kind of genius for simply being kind the poor people in the village call me the kind one to distinguish me from kathy who poor lamb never did an unkind thing in her life but she didn't always understand that was the difference when they did wrong she was shocked and estranged while i felt dreadfully dreadfully sorry and more anxious than ever to help them again kathy used to think me too mild but i don't know the consequences of sin are so terrible in themselves that i always long to throw in a lot of help with the blame the people about here seem to know this by instinct for they come to me in their troubles and anxieties and shames poor souls and open their hearts as they do to nobody else sure then most people are kind in patches an old woman said to me one day t 
tis yourself that is kind all round i don't know that it's much credit to do what is no effort and certainly if i could choose a role in life it would be to play the part of a good fairy comforting people cheering them up helping them over stiles springing delightful little surprises upon them just where the road looked blocked trouble is that i've no gift for organized charity i have a pretty middling strong will of my own pig-headedness aunt emmeline calls it and committees drive me daft they may be useful things in their way but it's not my way i want to get to work on my own and not to sit talk talk talking over every miserable piffling little detail no if i play fairy i must at least be free to wave my own wand and to find my own niche where i can wave it to the best advantage the great all-absorbing question is where and how to begin advertisements are the orthodox refuge of the perplexed suppose for the moment that i advertised stating my needs and qualifications in the ordinary shilling a line fashion it would run something like this lady young healthy good appearance seeks occupation for a loving heart town or country travel if required it sounds like an extract from a matrimonial paper i wonder how many or to speak more accurately how few bachelors would exhibit any anxiety to occupy the vacancy i might add private means and then the answers would arrive in sacks i should have the offer of a hundred husbands and a dozen kind homes with hot and cold water cheerful society a post-office within a mile and a golf course in the neighbourhood a hundred mothers of families would welcome me to their bosoms and a hundred spinsters would propose the grand tour and intellectual companionship but i want to be loved for myself and in return to love and to help i am not thinking of marriage some day i shall probably fall in love like everyone else and be prepared to go off to the ural mountains or kamchatka or any other remote spot for the privilege of accompanying my jock i shall probably be just as mad and deluded and happy and ridiculous as any other girl when my turn comes but it hasn't come yet and i'm not going to sit still and twiddle my thumbs pending its approach i'm in no hurry it is in my mind that i should prefer a few preliminary independent years aunt eliza drove over this afternoon to cheer me up she means well but her cheering capacities are not great her mode of attack is first to enlarge on every possible ill and reduce one to a state of collapse from pure self-pity and then to proceed to waft the same troubles aside with a casual flick of the hand she sat down beside me stroked my hand i hate being pawed and set plaintively to work poor dear i know you are feeling desolate it's so hard for you isn't it dear having no other brother or sister makes it all the harder doesn't it dear and kathy leant on you so you must feel that your work is gone stranded that's the feeling isn't it i do understand but sudden change to major key she is happy you must forget yourself in her joy i said oh yes and removed my hand under the pretense of feeling for a handkerchief her face lengthened again and she drew a deep sigh minor i always feel it is the last straw for a woman when she has to give up her home in a time of trouble a home is a refuge and you have made the clow so charming it will be a wrench to move all the dear old furniture and to leave the garden where you and kathy were so happy together wherever you look poor dear you must feel a fresh stab associations so precious aren't they to a woman's heart major but material things are of small value after all dear we learn that as we grow old a true woman can make a home wherever she goes oh i suppose she can minor but of course the loneliness is a handicap 
having no one who needs you no one to welcome you home so sad especially in the evenings solitary people are apt to grow morose you will miss kathy's bright happy ways quick change well 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 no one need be lonely in this world there are thousands of suffering souls fainting by the wayside for lack of the very help which it is in your power to give if i could just tell you some of the cases i know i pricked up my ears i wish you would i like to hear about other people's troubles my dear such a startling way of putting things you don't mean it i know your tender heart of course the worst cases are in the big cities london now every time i go to london and travel as one is obliged to do from one end of the city to the other i look out upon those endless rows and rows of streets of small houses and look at the great towering blocks of flats at every turn and feel appalled at the thought of the misery that goes on inside and the joy my dear what kind of joy can there be in such places not your kind perhaps nor mine but real enough all the same people love one another and have their own pleasures and interests little clerks come home to little wives and tell of little successes women in ugly houses buy some new piece of ugliness and find it beautiful and rejoice babies toddle about fat pretty things with curly mops she stared at me blankly curly mops what does it matter whether their hair curls or not oh my dear in such circumstances children are not all joy i had a letter from a friend the other day lady templar we were at school together her nephew wenham thorold has lost his wife married at twenty-three so silly a clergyman's daughter without to sue now of course she dies and leaves him with five small children very inconsiderate very inconvenient for the poor man only thirty-five and a baby in arms how will it help him if its hair curls he puts the elder children to bed himself after his day's work quite pathetic to hear of wouldn't he have been happier with one possibly for the present later on the five will help him and he will be glad and proud children dragged up by strangers are not always a credit and pride i hope these may be but if you had heard my friends tales they live in a flat quite a cheap block in some unfashionable neighbourhood no society he has one small maid and a housekeeper to look after the children most inefficient adela says holes in their stockings and shrieks the moment their father is out of the building what was he like he who oh the poor father handsome she said but haggard the templar knows poor helpless man a horrible feeling surged over me i felt it rise swell crash over my head like a flood of water a conviction that i was listening to no tale but to a call that providence had heard my cry for work and had answered it in the person of wenham thorold handsome and haggard in the person of little thorold girls with holes in their stockings of little thorold boys who shrieked and a thorold baby with problematic hair that might or might not curl i cowered at the prospect all very well to talk of my own way and my own niche all very well to dream of fairy wands and of the soothing self-ingratiating role of transforming other people's grey into gold while the said people sat agape transfixed with gratitude and admiration but how extraordinarily prosaic and unromantic the process became when worked out in sober black and white to mend stockings to stifle shrieks to be snubbed by a cross housekeeper probably in addition to be sent to coventry by the handsome and haggard one under suspicion of manoeuvring for his affections yes at the slightest interference he would certainly put me down as a designing female with designs on his hand at this last thought i sniggered and aunt eliza looked severe 
no subject for mirth evelyn i'm surprised you who are always talking of wanting to help but could i help him i will if i can i have money and time and am longing for work could i banish the housekeeper and introduce a variation by paying to take her place aunt eliza looked at the ceiling and informed it obviously though dumbly that when nieces talked nonsense it was a waste of breath to reply outraged dignity spoke in her rigid back in the thin contour of her cheek a was niece to speak of being a housekeeper i realized that i had gone too far for to jest at the expense of the family pride was an unpardonable offence so i added hastily or i might take a flat hard by and do good by stealth win the housekeeper's heart and then take charge of the five when she gads forth some of the other tenants might need help too in those great big buildings where scores of family live under one roof there must always be somebody who needs a helping hand it would be rather a charming role to play good fairy to the mansions even as i spoke a flash of inspiration seemed to light up my dark brain my own careless words had created a picture which charmed which intrigued it was as though a veil had lifted and i caught sight of beckoning hands i saw before me a great grim building story after story rising an unbroken line the dusty windows staring into the windows of a twin building across the road just as tall just as unlovely just as desolate i saw a bare entrance hall in which pale-faced men and women came and went i passed with them into so-called homes where electric light burned day and night and little children played in nurseries about the size of a comfortable bed everybody as it seemed was worn down with the burden of the inevitable daily task so that there was no energy left for beauty for gaiety for joy suppose oh suppose there lived in that building one tenant whose mission it was to supply that need to be a happiness monger a fairy godmother a, a living bran pie of unexpected and stimulating helps for the first moment since that motor-car turned out of the gate bearing away the bride and bridegroom a glow of warmth took the place of the blank ache in the place where my heart used to be it hurt a little just as it hurts when the circulation returns to frozen limbs but it was a wholesome hurt a hundred times better than the calm that had gone before there glowed through my veins the exultation of the martyr now farewell to ease and luxury to personal desires and ambitions henceforth i lived only to serve the race oh auntie it's a glorious idea why didn't i think of it before my vocation is ready and waiting for me but i should never have found it if it hadn't been for you why shouldn't i take a little flat in some unfashionable block and play good fairy to my neighbours a free unmarried woman is so useful there ought to be one in every family a permanent aunt mary to lend a hand in its joys and sorrows its spring cleanings and its jams nowadays aunt marys are so scarce they are absorbed in their own schemes why shouldn't i take up the role and be a universal fairy to the mansions devoting my idle time to other people who need me ready to love and to scold to bake and to brew to put my fingers in other people's pies leaving behind sugar for them and pulling out plums for myself of soothing and comfort and joy my voice broke suddenly i was awfully lonely and the thought of those figurative plums cut to the heart the tears trickled down my cheeks i i forgot where i was and to whom i was speaking and just sobbed out all that was in my heart oh oh to be needed again to have someone to care for that would help that would fill the gap that would make life worth while instinctively 
i stretched out my hands in appeal for sympathy and understanding oh don't be silly said aunt eliza End of chapter two chapter three of the lady of the basement flat by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain charmian fane intervenes during the next days the idea of making my home in london and playing fairy godmother to the tenants in a block of flats took an ever-deepening root in my heart i pondered on it incessantly and worked out plans as to ways and means bridget should go with me as general factotum for my method of living must be as simple as possible since the neighbours would be more likely to confide their troubles to the ear of one who was apparently in the same position of life as themselves smart clothing would be unnecessary also and a hundred and one luxuries of a leisured life i mentally drew up a list of things taboo and regarded it with let me be honest lingering regret i was quite quite willing to deny myself but it is folly to pretend that it didn't cost a pang i like good clothes and dainty meals and motor-cars and space and luxury and people to wait upon me when i'm tired and unlimited supplies of flowers and fruit and hot water to say nothing of my own little share of variety and fun down at the bottom of my heart a lurking doubt of myself stirred into life and spoke with an insistent voice all very well evelyn but can you keep it up are you brave enough strong enough unselfish enough to give up all that has hitherto made your life and to be satisfied with living through others won't the time come when nature will rebel and demand a turn for yourself and then evelyn then what are you going to do could you ever respect yourself again if having put your shoulder to the wheel you drew back and lapsed into selfish indifference as for aunt emmeline she turned on the cold tap and kept it on at a continuous trickle exaggerated nonsense you always were exaggerated evelyn from a child be kind of course that's only your duty but i call it officious and presumptuous to interfere in other people's lives you of all people at your age with your looks what have my looks to do with it my dear it is not your fault but i've said it before and i say it again you are a showy there is something about you which makes people stare dear cathy could pass along quietly or sit in a corner of a room and be conveniently overlooked but you i'm not paying you a compliment my dear i consider it a misfortune you take the eye wherever you go people will notice you and gossip about your movements at twenty-six and with your appearance i ask you candidly as aunt to niece do you consider yourself a suitable person to live alone and minister to widowers well if you put it like that i don't but what of the children who shriek and have holes in their stockings mightn't they like me better just because i am young and look nice i laughed as i spoke but aunt emmeline was so pleased that i showed some glimmerings of reason that she said suavely wait ten years dear till your hair is grey you will age early with those sharp features in ten or twelve years you can do as you please i thought but did not say my dear aunt but i shall do it now a week passed by while i pondered and worried and then at last came a lead from without a morning dawned when bridget brought my letters with my early tea and set them down on the table by my bed four letters this morning and only one of the lot you'll be caring to see bridget takes a deep interest in my correspondence and always introduces a letter with a note of warning or congratulation that bothering creature is worrying at you again 
there's a laugh you'll be having over master george's fun you paid that bill before don't be letting them come over you with their tricks it is of course reprehensible behaviour on the part of a maid presumptuous familiar interfering but bridget is bridget and i might as soon command her not to use her tongue as to stop taking an interest in anything that concerns herself as a matter of fact i don't try servility and decorum and a machine like respect are to be hired for cash at any registry office but bridget's red-hot devotion her childlike unshakable conviction that everything that miss evelyn does and says or doesn't say and doesn't do is absolutely right ah that's beyond price no poor forms and ceremony shall stand between bridget and me i lifted the letters and had no difficulty in selecting the one which would give me joy strangely enough it was written by one of the newest of my friends one whose very existence had been unknown to me two years before we had met at a summer hotel where Kathy and i chanced to be staying and never shall i forget my first sight of charmion fane as she trailed into the dining-room and seated herself at a small table opposite our own she was so tall and pale and shadowy in the floating grey chiffon cloak that covered her white dress she lay back in her chair with such languor and drooped her heavy eyelids with an air of such superfine indifference to her fellow men that Kathy and i decided then and there that she was succumbing to the effects of a dangerous operation and with care might be expected to last six or eight weeks we held fast to this conclusion till the next morning when we met our invalid striding over the moors clad in abbreviated tweeds and the manniest of hard felt hats Kathy said that she was plain i said well not plain exactly but queer at dinner the same night we amended the verdict and voted her rather nice twenty-four hours later she represented our ideal of female charm and we figuratively wept and rent our garments because she exhibited no interest in our charming selves an inspection of the visitor's book proved that her name was mrs fane but that was not particularly enlightening especially as no home address was given but on the third day just as we were beginning to concoct dark schemes by means of which we could force acquaintanceship the grey lady entered the lounge marched unhesitatingly across to our corner stood staring down at us as we sat on the sofa and said shortly this is ridiculous we are wasting time we three are the only really interesting people in the hotel we are dying to know each other and we know it come for a walk and lo in another minute we were on the high road Kathy on one side i on the other gazing at her with adoring eyes while she said briskly my name is charmian fane i am quite alone no children thirty-two i don't live anywhere in particular just prowl round from one place to another if there are any other dull necessary details that you want to know ask and get them over then we can talk we laughed and replied with similar biographical sketches on our own account and then we did talk about books and travels and hobbies and mankind in general and gradually growing more and more intimate or rather conscious of our intimacy for we were friends after the first hour of our personal hopes fears difficulties and mental outlooks when we came in Kathy and i faced each other in our bedroom almost incoherent with pleasure and excitement well what an afternoon my dear isn't she Kathy waved her hands to express a superlative beyond the power of words she is the most fascinating the most interesting the most original and she likes us too as much as we like her isn't it glorious she hasn't spoken to another soul how could we have called her plain evelyn did you notice that she never spoke of her husband she wears grey and violet so he has probably been dead for some years but she never referred to him in the slightest possible way would it be likely Kathy, in our very first talk yes 
declared cathy sturdily not intentionally perhaps but with ordinary people it would have slipped out we went to italy my husband liked this or that she never advanced even as far as the we she must have been dreadfully dreadfully fond of him i wondered the death of a beloved husband or wife is a devastating blow but when the memory is beautiful time softens it into a hallowed sweetness it is the bitter sorrow which refuses to be healed which fills the heart with a ceaseless unrest not even to cathy would i express my doubts but the conviction weighed upon me that the cloud which hung over charmian fain was the remembrance of unhappiness rather than joy for the next fortnight the greater part of our time was spent in charmian's company generally we were a party of three but in every day there came a precious hour or so when i had her alone and hugged the secret confidence that the tete-a-tete was as welcome to her as to myself everything that was to be told about my own uneventful life she knew before many days were past but of her own past she never spoke from incidental remarks we found that she had been the godchild of a well-known politician long since dead and that at eighteen she had been presented at court which two discoveries proved useful as they were enough to convince the aunts that charmian was a safe and desirable acquaintance before she was twenty the scene had apparently shifted to america where she had lived her several years and presumably though she never said so had met her husband and spent her brief married life widowed childless thirty-two those few words supplied all that i knew of charmian fane except the obvious facts which were patent to the eye she was oddly undemonstrative and for all her charm had a manner which made it impossible to approach one step nearer than she herself decreed even when it came to the moment of saying good-bye i could not tell whether she wished to continue our friendship or would be content to let it drop as a passing incident of travel but to my joy she held on to my hand with a grip which was almost an appeal and her thin finely cut lips twitched once and again she looked full into my face with her strange eyes the pupil large the iris a light grey ringed with an edge of black and said simply i'll miss you but it will go on we will always be friends that was all and during the two years which had passed since that day we had met only once for another short summer holiday and repeated invitations to the clow had received the same refusal i am not ready for visit-making letters i had received in plenty and she had sent cathy a handsome really an extraordinarily handsome gift on her marriage and to me the dearest of letters understanding everything without being told entering into my varying moods with exquisite comprehension in return i had poured out my heart telling her of my loneliness my difficulty about the next step and now at last here came the reply i sent bridget away drank my tea at a gulp and settled down to read in luxurious enjoyment it was a longer letter than i had yet received and i had a premonition that it would clear the way but i did not realize how epoch-making it was to prove dear evelyn wastneys i've been through it my dear and i know it doesn't bear talking of so we won't talk but just pass on what next you ask i've been trying to solve that problem for the last four years and am no nearer a solution so i can't tell you my dear but i have an idea which might possibly provide a halfway house for us both until the clouds lift this summer i happened literally happened upon a small country place about two hours rail from town an agent would describe it as a desirable gentleman's residence comprising four entertaining rooms and eight bedrooms glass stabling and grounds of four acres artistically laid out but never mind the agent take it from me that that house is ideal long low irregular rooms just waiting to be made beautiful no set garden but a wilderness of flowers 
and a belt of real woodland dry soil all the sun that is to be had and an open countryside agreeably free from villadom i was tempted badly tempted but could not face settling down alone only last week the agent wrote to me again evelyn we fit each other we are friends by instinct how would you like to take that house with me for the next two or three years and furnish it between us with our best bits understand before we go any further not for a moment do i suggest that we settle down to a definite home and a jog-trot country life i couldn't stand it for one and i doubt whether you could either but we suit each other evelyn there's that mysterious psychological link between us which makes it good to be together i have a feeling that we could put in some good times in that house financially it would be an economy we should save storage of furniture and have a convenient refuge in case of illness the place is cheap and could be run with quite a small staff and would be a pleasant means of returning hospitalities we could settle down for as long as it suited us three months two months a few weeks as the case might be and then when the impulse to roam came upon us we should simply rise up and depart i should never ask where you were going if you asked me i should not reply probably i should not know on certain months of the year the house might become the exclusive property of one owner when she might invite her own friends and disport herself as she pleased again we might devote a certain period to charity and entertain lame dogs there is no end to the good and the pleasure that might be got out of that house pastimes is its name isn't it quaint and suggestive and on the enclosed sheet you will behold elaborate calculations of the sum which it would cost to run the figures are over the mark for i never delude myself by under calculating in money matters for my own part i can pay up and have enough over to wander at will can you do the same if not say no at once and the project is buried for evermore you must not be tied i refuse to be a party to shutting you up in the depths of the country for the whole year round you've had enough of that what you need now is movement and the jostle of other lives but if in addition you can afford a rest house a summer lodgment a sanatorium for mind and body and a meeting place with a friend then pack your box evelyn come and look at pastimes with me your friend charmian fane i threw down the letter and seized the sheet of calculations in an agony of eagerness a glance at the final edition brought relief yes i could do it pay my full share and still have a handsome margin left over once satisfied on that point there could not be a moment's hesitation for it would be glorious to share a house with charmian and to have her companionship for some months of each year my whole life was transfixed by the prospect and yet she was right i could not have accepted the offer if it had meant a permanent settling down to a luxurious country life i was too restless too eager for experience too anxious to discover my very own work and to do it in my very own way the picture of that old english house with its panelled rooms set in a surrounding wealth of flowers and green gripped hold of my imagination but here was an odd thing it was powerless to banish another picture in which there was no rose and no blue but only dull neutral tints the picture of a basement flat in a grey london road with electric burners instead of sun and for view a vista of passing feet belonging to bodies cut off from sight i could not even for charmian give up the prospect of that flat and all that it had come to mean but let me acknowledge it honestly it was a balm and a relief to know that i could have a means of escape and that at culminating moments of weariness when everything seemed wry and disappointing and the whole weight of seven stories seemed to be pressing down on my brains i could bang my door turn the key and fly off to peace and beauty and a healing pandering to personal tastes 
woman is a complex character and i am no better than my kind i felt it in me to be an angel of self-denial and patience for say the third of the year i know for a certain fact that i should have a bad lapse if i tried to keep it up for the remaining thirds now thanks to charmaine the way was made easy and i could put my hand to the plough without fear of drawing back i leapt out of bed in a tingle of excitement impossible to lie still when things were happening at such a rapid rate the sun was shining and looking at a belt of trees in the distance i could catch a faint shimmer of green it is perhaps the most intoxicating moment of the year when that first gleam of spring greets the eye and this special year it held an added exhilaration for it seemed to speak of the budding of fresh personal life i laughed i sang the depression of the last weeks fell from me like a cloak and i faced the future glad and undismayed with the reading of that letter had come an end to indecision i now knew exactly what i was about to do write to charmian and fix the earliest possible date for a meeting in town from town we would inspect pastimes the while i instituted inquiries for a suitable flat the two homes secured i would then return to the clough and divide my furniture into two batches send them off to their several destinations and follow myself hot foot it would take some time to put both dwellings in order but it would be interesting work i love the making of interiors and if pastimes must be fitted beautifully to do justice to itself still more would it be needful to turn the uninspiring flat into a haven of comfort and cheer at this precise moment my prancing brought me in front of the long mirror and what i beheld therein brought me up with a gasp twenty-six is quite a venerable age but at moments of happiness and exhilaration it has a disconcerting trick of switching back to seventeen that smiling bright-eyed pink-and-white-cheeked girl in the glass with two long pigtails of hair hanging to her waist looked really absurdly juvenile given a small stretch of imagination you might have believed that she was a flapper preparing for her last term at school by no possible mental effort could you have placed her as a deuce maiden lady living alone in london devoting herself to good works in a manner as adventurous as it was unusual mothers of children would insinuate that i was a child myself troubled matrons would purse their lips and say i can't tell you my dear you are too young certainly oh most certainly men of all ages would put me down as a designing minx in vain industry self-sacrifice and generosity that young face that bright youthful colouring would nullify all my efforts it was true it was true i looked as aunt eliza had pointed out a dozen years too young for the part people would stare people would talk people would advise me to go back and live with my aunts and wait ten years in a frenzy of impatience i seized the two long plates and twisted them now this way now that astonishing the difference which hairdressing can make i have read of a heroine who passed successfully as her own twin sister by the simple device of plainly brushed hair and puritanical garments the sister of course sporting marcel waves and parisian costumes i dipped my brush in the water jug and dragged back my own hair in a plastered mass clamping the plates to my head i looked like a dutch doll clean and chubby and alas considerably younger than before i parted it in the middle and glued it over my ears i looked like a naughty schoolgirl who had had her hair dressed by a maiden aunt i piled the plates in a coronet over my forehead i looked like a portrait of a norwegian damsel dressed for her bridal i threw down the brush in disgust and stamped with impatience no use not a bit of use all the hairdressing in the world could not make me look old or even approximately middle-aged the ugliest flannel blouse that was ever made while it would certainly be hideously unbecoming could not add one year let alone ten to my age it was a bitter blow all that morning i went about pondering the desperate question of how to look old aunt emmeline had prophesied that i should know soon enough with those beat features but i wanted to know now 
not in any permanent disagreeable fashion but as a kind of sleight of hand trick by which i could be mature one day and the next in blooming youth elderly in london young at pastimes a deuce unremarkable body in the basement flat and in surrey a lady of leisure rings on her fingers and bells on her toes aunt eliza would have cried once more oh don't be silly if i had confronted her with such a problem i said don't be silly to myself many times over in the course of that day but i persisted in being silly all the same at the back of my mind lingered the conviction that if i went on thinking long enough a solution would come how could i manage to look old i asked the question of myself every hour of the next few days i asked it of every one i met and was fatuously assured that i demanded the impossible at long last i asked it of old bridget whose sound common sense had come to my rescue times and again sure my dear your husband will manage that for you was bridget's instant solution not the husband i shall choose i replied with easy assurance a moment's pause was devoted to the problematical prince charming whose mission it would be to keep me young and then i asked tentatively what shall i look like bridget when i am old bridget folded her arms and regarded me with a critical stare your hair will turn grey and them fine straight brows of yours will grow thin or maybe fall out altogether and leave you with none and you wear spectacles and have lines around your eyes but it's neither the grey hairs nor the specks that spoils the looks it's not them that's the worst i stared at her open mouth trembling between shrinking and curiosity it's the shape of the cheeks said bridget darkly yourself now and the ladies of your age it's pretty slim bits of faces you have going to a peak at the chin when you're old it runs to squares and doubles look to your cheeks miss if you want to keep young she unfolded her arms stretched them at full length and comfortably folded them again her broad chest heaved in a cackle of amused reminiscence sure do you remind her miss kathleen when she play-acted the old lady the last christmas party poor old bridget she got the surprise of her life in my reception of that simple question jumping out of my chair dancing round whooping and hurraying like a daft thing as she afterwards described my movements then to find herself at one moment enthusiastically patted on the back and at the next to be pushed towards the door and exhorted to hurry hurry to mount to the attic and bring down the old tin box well it was disconcerting to say the least of it and bridget's dignity was visibly upset she had forgotten that all the make-ups which we had used for various christmas festivals were stored away in that old tin box and consequently could not guess that i was fired with an ambition to try on kathy's disguise forthwith ten minutes later i was standing before the glass and enthusiastically acclaiming the truth of bridget's statement as i stared at the reflection of a spectacled dame with grizzled eyebrows grey hair banded smoothly over the cheeks and a bulging fullness at the base of each cheek it was the cheeks that made the disguise spectacles and hair still left the personality of the face untouched even the bushy eyebrows were but a partial disguise but with the insertion of those small india-rubber pads came an utter and radical change that chubby square-faced woman was not evelyn wastney's never by any possibility could she see forty again so far as propriety went she might roam alone from one end of the world to the other if she lived in the largest block of flats that was ever erected her neighbours would regard her comings and goings with serene indifference admirable woman she did not take the eye i met her spectacled glance with a beam of approval i have it i have it i must dress for the part in london i'll be a middle-aged aunt in surrey a niece my own niece and namesake who of her charity consents to receive some of her auntie's proteges and give them a good time the wildness 
the audacity of the project made to me its chief appeal my life interest had been so sheltered so hedged round by convention that at times it had seemed as though there was a wall of division between me and every other human creature it was so difficult to show oneself in one's real colours to see and know other people as they really were but now oh what a unique and exhilarating experience it would be to taste at the same time the romance of youth and the freedom of age to witness the different sides of other characters as exhibited in their treatment of aunt and niece that one illuminating suggestion of bridget's has cleared the way from the moment of hearing there had been no real hesitation before night fell my plans were made and a telegram to charmion was speeding on its way a new life lay before me a dual life teeming with interest and possibility on one hand my fate must be to some extent bound up with that of charmion fane the most interesting and in a sense mysterious woman i had ever met on the other i was plunging into the unknown and transforming myself into a new personality to meet the new circumstances i stared at myself in the glass and solemnly shook my grey head evelyn my dear be prepared you are going to have an adventurous time end of chapter three Chapter Four of *The Lady of the Basement Flat* by Mrs. George D. Horn Vesey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A talk in London. The aunts expressed a mitigated approval of Charmion's proposal. Mrs. Fane came of a good family and was very well left. Her married estate, moreover gave her the privilege of chaperonage so that the dual establishment might be quite a good arrangement all things considered until until echoed aunt eliza eloquently nodding coyly at me while i stared into space with basilisk calm i object to references to my problematical marriage especially by aunts the great until never arrived for them yet they feel quite annoyed because twenty-six has found me still a spinster i made my journey to london with a sense of great adventure bridget going with me in the dual role of maid and mentor she was the only person who was to accompany me into the new life and experience had proved that her sound common sense might be trusted to act as a brake on the wheels of my own impetuosity we stayed the morning in town when i interviewed a house agent and set him on the search for suitable flats and then we adjourned to the west end to buy a becoming new hat it always soothes me to buy hats in times of doubt and depression it is an admirable tonic to the feminine mind at three o'clock we left waterloo for our two hours journey and arrived at the old-fashioned inn which was to act as rendezvous before half-past five charmion was awaiting us in a private sitting-room long oak-beamed spotlessly clean and a trifle musty with that faint but unmistakable mustiness which hangs about old rooms and old furniture tea was set out on one half of the oak dining-table the china was of the old-fashioned white and gold order the cups very wide at the brim and cramped at the handle and possessing a dear little surprise rose at the base which peeped out through a hoar-frost of sugar as you drained the last gulp charmion laughed at my delight over that rose but i was in the mood to be pleased to see happy auguries in trivial happenings i hailed that rose as a type of unexpected joys charmion was dressed in business-like grey tweeds with a soft grey felt hat slouched over her head she looked very pale very frail intensely vibratingly alive this extraordinary contradiction between body and mind made a charm and mystery which it is difficult to express in words 
one longed to protect and shield her to tuck her up on a sofa and tend her like a fragile child at the very same moment that mentally one was sitting at her feet domineered by the influence of a master mind i ate an enormous tea and charmian crumbled a piece of cake upon her plate then we had the things taken away and drew up to the fire and toasted our toes and looked into each other's eyes and exclaimed simultaneously well hitherto we had talked on general subjects kathleen's marriage the break-up of the old home my own journey etc but now we were free from interruption for an hour at least and the great subject could be safely tackled evelyn do you realize that nothing is settled and that nothing need be unless you are absolutely wholeheartedly sure i am absolutely wholehearted about several things already what sort of things were you thinking about well take the house first it meets my ideal but it mayn't be yours you must promise to give an unvarnished opinion make your mind easy if there's one thing that i may claim to be above all others it is unvarnished i have a brutal frankness in expressing my own opinion if through nice feeling i try to disguise it my manner shrieks it aloud that's all right then i'm glad to hear it next comes the question of time we should have to take a lease of three years i don't know if you'd care to bind yourself for so long that reminded me of the aunts until and i said solemnly charmian tell me the worst is there an eligible bachelor who owns the next place ready to discover me picking his roses or trespassing on his side of the stream and to make love to me forthwith they always do in books you know when girls go to live in country houses charmian smiled her slow languorous smile i have amused myself with looking up the names of the people living in all the big houses around they seem uniformly made up of couples to the best of my belief there is not a single man bachelor or widower within many miles i said oh and felt the faint natural dismay which any human girl would feel in the circumstances charmian herself was enough romance for the present and a precipitate lover next door would for the moment have been de trop but still my expression unvarnished evidently betrayed my feelings for charmian smiled sighed and stretched out a caressing hand let's be honest it is foolish to set up a partnership in the dark is there any one evelyn who may swoop down upon us at a moment's notice and carry you off to share his house but to the best of my knowledge there is not a solitary one i am quite sure of one thing and that is that however wildly he swooped i wouldn't go but there must be you are so pretty evelyn and so attractive there must have been oh yes two but not real lovers charmian only pretend us one was young and needy and ambitious and thought that i should look very well sitting at the head of his table incidentally that my money would be useful to provide the table and the things upon it the other he was rather a dear and he cared enough to give me a pang but he was happily married last year to a girl who is as unlike me in every respect as you can possibly imagine well, they are both ancient history now and you you yourself you've never been in love if any other woman had asked me such a question there would have been short shrift with her charmian herself had never before attempted such personalities but now when she deemed it necessary she spoke without a flicker of hesitation her grey eyes staring full into mine it would have seemed ridiculous to take offence once at first sight quite bowled over we met at a hotel she knew what i meant made a dainty little grimace and bent her head in a small bow of acknowledgment which somehow managed to look quite regal and stately i longed to put one or two questions in return widows have been known to marry again why should i not wish to be reassured on my own account why should it be wrong for me to force confidences when she herself had led the way it would not be wrong it would be right and prudent and praiseworthy the only objection was 
i could not do it after that little bow of acknowledgment charmion threw back her head until it rested on the high cushioned back of her chair that's settled then she said quietly her heavy lids drooped over her eyes her fine white hands were folded in her lap there was in voice and manner an air of finality which was as impervious as a barrier of barbed wire not for any bribe in the world would i have attempted to scale it the next morning bright and early we chartered a fly and lumbered along two miles of country lanes and then suddenly turning a corner found ourselves at the gate of pastimes it was a dull grey day of which i was glad for any place can look attractive in spring sunshine i have seen even a third-rate london square look quite frisky and inviting with a shimmer of green over the black trees and the spring cleaned windows sending out flashes of light it's a very different spectacle on a november afternoon five minutes acquaintanceship with pastime showed however that its predominating quality was cheerfulness there was a great deal of panelling on the walls but it was of white wood not oak and the old small latticed windows had been converted into deep bays filled with great panes of plate glass a pagan proceeding from an artistic point of view but infinitely cheerful and healthy there was a large central hall from either side of which opened two rooms of medium size facing respectively east and west a quaint descent of two steps led the way to a really spacious drawing-room through the great windows of which was a lovely vista of velvet lawn and a great cedar drooping its green branches to the ground parallel with the drawing-room and also facing south was a long glassed-in apartment which had evidently been used to harbour plants garden chairs and impedimenta but which revealed itself to our eyes as an ideal sun-parlour for chilly days sheltered from draughts by the outstanding walls yet with a glass roof and frontage to catch every ray of sun the parlour would be an ideal refuge for spring and autumn so far as public rooms went we were well off with five apartments at the disposal of two people mine yours ours cried charmion waving her hands descriptively first towards the two smaller rooms then to the other three in turn in the hall we will eat the big room shall be no ordinary formal drawing-room but a living-room a deux the sun parlour also we shall share but the sulkies shall be private ground hermetically sealed against intruders there is a spare room upstairs which can be spared for muddles i have a fastidiously tidy eye it offends me to see things scattered about but my hands will go on scattering them so it is necessary for my peace of mind to have a muddle room where i can deposit bundles at a moment's notice and feel sure that they will not be tidied away well shall we go upstairs and see the bedrooms where are the stairs i asked curiously for from no corner of the hall was there a glimpse of staircase visible i had not thought about it before but now i realized it was just this absence which gave that touch of comfort and privacy which is wanting in the ordinary entrance lounge there was no draughty well no galleried space overhead from which curious ears could overhear private confidences i stared round mystified till charmion opened yet another doorway and behold there was the staircase the oddest curliest specimen of its kind mounting up and up within a narrow well for all the world like steps in a church tower except that these were wide and shallow and that a thick brass rod had been placed on the outer wall to act as a banister in case of need whoever had built pastimes had plainly believed that stairs were needed for the purpose of transit only and had refused to waste space on their adornment on the first landing were several good bedrooms two of which possessed big sunny balconies facing south that settles it i told charmion if i had had any doubts before the balconies would have decided me once and for all all my life i've yearned to have a bedroom opening onto a really big balcony i'm crazy about balconies 
think of the happy hours one has spent on balconies in switzerland and italy to have been in a room without one would have been to lose half the joy and even in england think of all the things one can do on a balcony of one's very own sleep out when it is hot air your mattress hang up your sponge grow your pet flowers dry your hair cry it out quietly when you feel blue sentimentalize over the railings when you feel rosé charmion's fine brows arched her lids drooped over her eyes i recognized the same expression which her face had worn the night before when for a moment i had seemed on the point of questioning her about her own romance once more i felt myself up against an impenetrable wall of reserve and hastily switched the conversation to the more prosaic topic of cupboards the very sound of a balcony bristles with romance but cupboards may be discussed with safety under the most lacerating circumstances there is something comfortably safe and stodgy about them and pastimes was so rich in this respect that we spent a happy half-hour appointing their future uses and jotting down notes for their improvement later on we visited the gardens beautiful even in their sleep and promising a very paradise for summer days the lawns and flower-beds immediately around the house were exquisitely in order but by far the greater part of the grounds was uncultivated there was a strip of real woodland where the light filtered down through the branches of tall old trees onto a carpet of dried leaves and bracken through which could be seen the close growing green shoots which foretold a harvest of bulbs later on no doubt there would be primroses and bluebells and when summer came if i knew anything about it there would be two hammocks swinging between spreading branches and two happy women reposing therein it was this real country air which gave pastimes its chief charm that evening charmion came to my room and we sat together by the fire and talked for three solid hours as a rule i get fidgety in the evening when talk is the only amusement but i can sit and listen to charmion for as long as she chooses to go on she is interesting she says things in an interesting way and has interesting things to say i have met extraordinarily clever and well-informed people who are terrible bores charmion would be interesting if she told one how to make an egg flip as i watched the delicate play of expression on the tired face which was yet so thrillingly alive as i listened to the slow soft drawl of her voice i felt a sudden rush of thankfulness and exhilaration charmion i cried suddenly aren't you thankful to be rich she flinched as though i had struck her and turned upon me a wild-eyed look of affront rich who says i'm rich who's been talking about my affairs have you have you been making inquiries to find out what i'm worth i stared deeply offended i have not perhaps it would have been more businesslike if i had but i accepted your word i asked a simple question because at the moment i happened to be feeling particularly thankful that i could afford to share pastimes with you and i imagined that you might possibly feel the same i paused waiting expectantly for words of apology and excuse but none came charmion stared at me below knitted brows and said shortly yes it is true you ought to have business references you shall have them my lawyer shall write to you at once i was a wretch to speak so sharply evelyn but you touched a sore point thankful no indeed money is a curse the greatest handicap a woman can have if i had my life to live again i should choose to be a penniless working girl she had taken off her rings and dropped them in a sparkling little heap on her lap the while she softly polished her long pink nails her padded kimono was of pink silk heavily embroidered with roses her feet were thrust into slippers of the same shade and material a more luxurious figure it would be difficult to imagine i rolled an expressive eye and she shrugged her shoulders in response oh of course i'm an artificial product and the chains hold fast i don't take any particular interest in my appearance but 
it is an ingrained habit to go through a certain routine it would annoy me to have dull nails so i polish them as you see also though i am dead tired i shall have my hair brushed for half an hour before going to bed and then steam my foolish face it bores me profoundly but it would bore me more to feel unkempt so far as that goes i should do exactly the same on twopence a week minus a maid and appliances charmion shrugged daintily soap and water are cheap fortunately i beg your pardon not your kind of soap you might find even hot water a difficulty i imagine that girls on twopence a week have to consider the price of boiling a kettle their hot water is not laid on moreover the poor dears must be dead tired in a way which you and i cannot even imagine it is their life charmion said loftily excuse me i mean to live that's why i am thankful to have money because it gives me more scope to live thoroughly poor innocent what a delusion money shuts the door of your cage a golden cage excellently padded but its bars shut out all the best things of life i laughed again for the statement was so opposed to all accepted theories <laughs> what best things for example confidence said charmion solemnly trust in one's fellow-creatures she lifted her heavy lids as she spoke and her eyes looked into mine in their grey depths was a blank empty expression which once seen is never forgotten for it speaks of a hurt so deep and keen that the memory of it breaks the heart i leapt from my seat and wrapped charmion in my arms oh my dear my dear there is one person you can trust whatever happens charmion you can count on me darling i know you've had troubles i don't ask to hear about them i only want to be allowed to love you and to do all i can to help and to comfort never never be afraid to ask for anything i can do i would put you before myself charmion if it ever came to a choice between our different interests i would indeed don't you believe it's true she laid her two hands on my shoulders and smiled you dear thing i believe it is you would sacrifice yourself for me and i should accept the sacrifice it's the way we are made you to give and i to demand let us pray my dear that the day may never come when our interests do clash of a certainty poor evelyn you would come off worse End of chapter four Chapter Five of the Lady of the Basement Flat by Mrs. George D. Horn Vasey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Pastimes and Mr. Maplestone. The next morning, bright and early, we called on the house agent to sign and seal the agreement which should make us the happy owners of pastimes for a term of years agreeably elastic mr edwards was a small dapper little man typically house agenty in manner even to the point of assuring us gravely that another tenant was urgently in the field and that we had secured our lease by the very skin of our teeth charmion lifted incredulous eyebrows but mr edwards you wrote to me a second time only a fortnight ago to say the house was still on your hands quite so madam and it was but only on monday mr maplestone motored over from wembley mr maplestone is squire there a very influential gentleman in these parts he is looking out a house for a relative and had only just heard that pastimes was vacant he drove over as i say and telegraphed to his friend that the house was too good to lose he expected a reply this evening when it will be too late charmion said calmly you told him of course that you were in treaty with another tenant i did madam quite so but the little man hesitated and fidgeted uncomfortably 
mr maplestone is um uh, accustomed to get his own way i explained that i must accept a definite offer and that you had the first option but i am afraid that he hardly realizes charmion waved an imperial hand we are not concerned with mr maplestone or what he expects pastimes is ours and that settles the question to-morrow morning miss wastneys and i will meet you at eleven o'clock to go over the house together it is in good order but we shall require a little decoration and painting here and there you will be able to advise us how to get it done well and quickly when i say quickly i mean quickly plenty of men must be put on to begin the work and finish it in a few days time not one or two who will drag on for weeks you can get us an estimate for time as well as for cost mr edwards bowed murmured and waved his hands he looked overcome poor man as well he might for if one would-be client demanded his own way the other was obviously determined to have hers between the two his path was not easy i smiled at him ingratiatingly just to help things along but he took little notice of me obviously in charmion's company i did not take the eye on the way home i expressed sympathy for the disappointed mr maplestone but charmion refused to agree i don't know the man so his pleasures and disappointments don't enter into my sphere promiscuous universal sympathy is too great a tax on the nervous system why should i distress myself about a man i have never seen not distress yourself exactly but you might cast a kindly thought he will be disappointed and the poor little agent will have a bad half hour now you are asking sympathy for the agent too evelyn aren't you the least bit in the world inclined to wear your heart on your sleeve charmian aren't you the least little bit inclined to be hard she agreed with unflinching candour i am it's the safer plan if one doesn't want to be hurt but what about the other people mayn't they be hurt instead she looked at me gravely for a moment and then with a smile which grew gradually broad and roguish we ought to strike a happy mean between us huh evelyn you are all credulity and gush and i refuse to disturb myself about other people or their affairs that's not true you disturbed yourself about me because it affected myself i had grown fond of you and so you entered into my life pure selfishness my dear i don't believe it i won't believe it it's no good trying to disillusion me charmian i put you on a topmost pinnacle and it would take a mighty effort to tumble you down dear thing murmured charmian fondly well suppose we talk of the drawing-room walls i'm a great believer in occupying oneself with the next step revelations of character will follow in due course i plump for white white certainly a warm cream white with not a touch of blue in it and the prevailing color let's count three quickly and then each say what we think we counted and the two words leapt crisply forth rose said i purple said charmian then we looked at one another beneath puckered brows rose lights up better purple is more uncommon rose is more cheerful in winter purple is restful in summer it seemed for a moment as if we had reached an impasse then came an illuminating thought why not both they harmonize well purple curtains and carpet the plain color very soft and subdued and cushions and shades of the right rose with our united treasures we ought to have a lovely room where are your things charmian stored she said shortly i tried a house for a few months but it was too lonely an experience 
but i have a passion for beautiful furniture it has amused me to pick up good specimens here and there now we shall enjoy them together wait till you see my spanish leather screen wait till you see my chinese cabinet i retorted and we talked things industriously for the next hour after luncheon charmion settled herself to write business letters drawing a big screen round her writing-table the better as she informed me to protect herself against my chatter you promised to be quiet but in five minutes time you begin again now please to remember that to all intents and purposes i am in another room and that until i choose to come forth i am dead to you and every one else do you understand these letters positively must get off to-night dear me i don't want to talk i shall be thankful to sit by the fire and enjoy a quiet read i said loftily and promptly drew up an old armchair and buried myself in the book which i had brought to while away the hours of my journey and then left unread because my own affairs were at the moment so much more absorbing than those of a fictitious heroine now that my mind was more at ease i found the story interesting enough and had read on for about an hour with undisturbed enjoyment when suddenly the door was flung open and a voice announced mr maplestone i leapt up putting up a hasty hand to smooth my ruffled hair that was the worst of having only one sitting-room visitors were hurled in upon one without a moment's warning happy charmion behind the screen i stared across the room and beheld a tall very tall thin man with short reddish hair and light blue angry-looking eyes he was dressed in riding costume which so far as his figure went became him exceedingly well he was probably somewhere about thirty-five and one glance at his tightly set lips and firm square chin was enough to demonstrate the truth of mr edwards assertion that he was a gentleman who likes his own way he had probably heard by now that for once he was to be thwarted and had come to tell me what he thought about it at this moment i forgot to be sorry for his disappointment in my exceeding sympathy for myself i glanced helplessly at the screen mrs fane i believe i am miss wastneys mrs fane is engaged but perhaps it is something that i he laid his hat and stick on the table may i have a few minutes conversation you will allow me to sit down certainly i pushed aside the easy chair and seated myself on one of the six uprights which were ranged about the room it felt so much more business-like and supporting mr maplestone seated himself opposite to me and rested his hands on his knees i am told that you have some idea of renting a house called pastimes near here we have taken pastimes mrs fane and myself have this morning signed the lease he waved an impatient hand this morning so i am told edwards has behaved very badly i warned him that things should not be hurried through they've not been hurried it is several months since mrs fane first saw the house and three weeks since negotiations were opened a second time i only heard this week that the house was vacant and should mr edwards the innocent inquiry of my voice was growing more and more marked was it his duty to have told you his eyes sent out a flash i could see the muscles of his hand clench against his knee i had scored a point and his anger was correspondingly increased perhaps i'd better explain he began in a tone of elaborate forbearance i live at wembley most of the land between here and there belongs to me pastimes happens to be outside the limit and so it escaped my memory i've not been over it before i did not know the last tenants for the last few weeks i have been looking for a house for my friend a member of the family who is returning from abroad invalided he pronounced the last word with emphasis 
staring fixedly at me the while i adapted my features to express polite commiseration it is natural that he should wish to live within driving distance of his friends oh quite the moment that i saw pastimes i knew for a sure thing that it would be just his house i am sorry but as he has not seen it he can't be disappointed there must be other houses i've already said i have been searching round for the last three weeks mr maplestone repeated in the carefully deliberate tone which disguises irritation nothing else will suit anything like so well i murmured indefinitely and glanced at the screen mentally i could see charmion leaning back in her chair smiling her slow fine smile inquisitively waiting to see just how firm or how weak i could be i was not inclined to be weak there was something in the personality of this big domineering man which roused an imp of contradiction we sat silent eyeing one another across the room i believe you and uh, mrs fane are strangers to this neighbourhood yes that is so you have no uh, special link or attraction i saw the trap and protested blandly oh yes we are delighted with pastimes it exactly suits our requirements mr maplestone frowned and fidgeted to and fro then suddenly leant forward straightening his face into what was obviously intended to be a smile miss wastneys will you forgive me if i am perfectly frank and honest and tell you exactly what is in my mind of course i will i am sure i declared mendaciously there can be nothing to forgive he had the grace to look a trifle ashamed but his resolution did not waver not a bit he looked straight into my eyes and said deliberately i want pastimes for the moment it has slipped through my fingers but a couple of hours cannot seriously affect your arrangements on my cousin's behalf i am anxious to take over the lease it would be an act of grace on your part if you would agree to this arrangement and deal with me as his representative the audacity of it for a moment i was silent for sheer want of breath but i could feel the blood rushing into my cheeks and knew that my eyes were sending out flashes to meet his own my appearance must have prepared him for my answer before it came uttered in a very calm very haughty aggravatingly deliberate tone we are not in the habit of changing our plans in a couple of hours pastime suits us it is unnecessary to look for another house the matter was decided this morning you understand that my cousin is an invalid and that he has a special reason for wishing to live in this neighbourhood there are other houses pastimes is not the only one that is vacant it is the only one that is suitable he repeated doggedly and there followed a silence during which he sat back in his chair staring at me with the light blue eyes which of all eyes in the world can look at once the coldest and the most angry if he could have done what he wanted at that moment he would have taken me by the shoulders and shaken me well to have made up his mind that a thing must be and to find himself thwarted by a bit of a girl it was unsupportable so unsupportable that even now he refused to believe it could be true giving himself a little shake like a dog who rouses himself to fresh efforts he again made that industrious attempt at a smile and began slowly i am afraid i have made a bad beginning please forgive me if i have seemed discourteous when we have talked things over quietly i have no doubt that we shall be able to reach a satisfactory agreement i am afraid i can't see how that can be there is only one pastime so one of us is bound to be disappointed he pounced on that as if scenting a hopeful weakness exactly yes but the disappointment would vary in intensity that is what i am anxious to point out when edwards told me that the tenant was a lady i felt reassured for it is a matter in which a woman's kindliness and good heart my eyes roved to the screen 
charmian's ears were assuredly open at this moment straining to hear my reply i raised my eyebrows and said frostily we are speaking of a business arrangement i am afraid that is the only light in which we can consider the matter we shall honourably fulfil our part of the agreement which we have signed you refuse to show any consideration for an invalid returning home after many years not at all if it is ever in our power as neighbours to show him any kindness we shall be eager to do all that is possible short of giving up our own house for his benefit would you do it yourself mr maplestone for the sake of a stranger you had never seen he stood staring at me his cheeks bulging with the moving lumps which show that people are swallowing down words which they dare not allow themselves to say with the same air of elaborate patience which he had shown before he explained slowly my cousin has been stationed in india in a border regiment he has served his country for thirty years now he has had a paralytic stroke and is making his way home by slow stages a man who has worked and suffered as he has done deserves a home and the gratitude of his fellow countrymen there are two sides to every question mr maplestone if i choose to go into details i might convince you that mrs fane and i have our own claims which seem to us equally strong he leapt from his seat and advanced until he stood directly facing my chair that finishes it it is no use appealing to your feelings let us make it pure business then i offer you a hundred pounds down for the reversion of the lease so it had come to this bribery undisguised i lowered my eyelids and sat silent an image of outraged dignity you refuse it is not enough two hundred then three still silence but my listening ears caught a threatening rustle behind the screen three hundred it is a good offer you are not bound to this neighbourhood you can find other houses to suit you still not enough name your own terms then how much will you take a million pounds the words leapt out of my mouth as it seemed of their own volition i was tired of this farcical bargaining and determined to put an end to it once for all i stood up and faced his blank stare of amazement without at least any outward shrinking surely it is useless to prolong this bargaining it is very unpleasant and humiliating mr maplestone set his square jaw you are only one partner to this transaction mrs fane is probably your senior if i were to see her she might be induced to name a more shall i say reasonable oh the cutting sarcasm of that tone figure two million the high clear tone struck across the room mr maplestone wheeled round and beheld charmian standing just outside the opening of the screen one hand raised to rest lightly on the curved wood coping she might have posed as a picture of graceful imperturbed ease so calm so smiling so absolutely unflurried and detached in both manner and bearing did she appear mr maplestone looked at her and this was a curious thing at one glance realized his defeat all my efforts at dignity and firmness had failed to convince him but behind charmian's frail essentially feminine exterior those keen eyes had at once detected that strain of inflexibility which i was only slowly beginning to realize it was hopeless to bandy words the squire knew as much and turned to the table to lift his hat and whip he gave a short scornful laugh <laughs> the term seems a trifle high i am afraid i must retire from the bidding pastimes is yours i hope he looked from me to charmian and his expression was not pleasant to see i hope you may not have cause to repent your bargain we bowed he bowed the door opened and shut charmian looked at me and shrugged her shoulders a declaration of war we have begun our campaign by quarrelling with the most influential gentleman in these parts 
things are getting exciting evelyn i did not speak reaction had set in and i felt a pang of remorse i did not want to quarrel with any one influential or uninfluential i was sorry i had been ungracious i felt a pang of sympathy for the poor big bad-tempered man riding homeward after his defeat i wondered when and how we should meet him again End of chapter 5